everyone, my name is Marnie. I'm known as Miss Gold Girl here on YouTube and my channel mostly focuses on beauty, fashion, a little bit of lifestyle. And today we're solidly in the lifestyle category. I recently purchased a Tesla, well, specifically I leased a Tesla uh, toward the end of September and my regular viewers have been asking a lot of questions about Tesla ownership. So I'm making this video for them, but those of you that are just finding me because you were looking for info on Tesla, here's some very basic info about what it is like to own a Tesla. So I'm going to cut over to the footage where I take you on a little tour of the car inside and outside, and then we'll come back here and I'll answer a whole bunch of questions that I got over on Instagram about owning a Tesla. So here is my 2021 Model Y performance model. I have a black exterior, white interior with the 21 inch rims and the red brake caliber. So let's take a walk around the car and I'll show you some of the features. So starting with the wheels and the rims, here's a better look at the 21 inch rims. I love that matte black and the red brake calipers. You'll see cameras all along Car. Here is one right there. Walking around the car. Here she is head on. And right under the hood emblem is the frunk, which I will pop open when we start talking about storage. And admittedly, I have not, oop, it thinks I've left. Admittedly, I have not used the frunk for anything just yet. An interesting feature on the car, hello is the door handle. And as you can see, one of my main complaints with the car is fingerprints everywhere. So the door handles are recessed into the car, which makes it give a very nice streamlined look. But I have to tell you two disadvantages. One, especially with the black exterior and black handles, if you park the car in a dark location, sometimes it's hard to actually find the door handles. You might need to turn on your um, phone light, but also you're touching constantly. So to open it, you push in and then the handle comes out. Continuing around the car, another feature on the performance model is the carbon fiber spoiler. And there it is up close and personal. And there it is from the rear view. All right, before we climb in the car, let me show you the storage front and back. You can't, of course, open the trunk um, from the button inside the car on your app or there's a button right underneath the ornament back here. Now mine is not going to open all the way. There is a really cool setting that you can do on the trunk because I have set it so that it doesn't open fully so it doesn't ding the top of my garage door. So I have it set where you can make it only open to a certain height. But here it is with the seats up the major difference for me when I was deciding between the Model X and the Model Y is that the Y appears to have a little more cargo room, whereas the Model X can more comfortably seat seven people. Since I don't need to seat seven people, but I do need to get a Weimaraner and uh, two other dogs in here, I wanted more cargo. When we have the dogs in here, we pop the seats down, and these are the buttons to make them go down a nice extra feature is underneath this mat which is extra we paid extra for the weather tech type mat is that's the actual part of the car sorry i should have vacuumed a little before i saw you but anyway there's this flap here and under this flap is even more storage it's a pretty deep area and obviously we have some tesla accessories that are um for charging on the go some cleaning cloths and um i think this is to inflate your tires Luckily, I've never had to try it. I'm actually gonna start in the back seat because a lot of people never show you the back seat of a car. We rarely have anybody back here, but here you can see the white leather. That's not leather. They call this vegan leather. I call it pleather, whatever. It's not real leather. We did choose the white. I know a lot of people ask, aren't you worried about it getting dirty? No, you can easily wipe it down with the leather wipes, all kinds of cleaners. Um, so no, I'm not worried about it. And it does have the system for putting in uh, child seats, not an issue for me. And then it does have two USB-C ports for the back passengers as well, which I really like. And all three of these seats are also heated. Actually, before we talk more about the inside of the car, 
this is essentially the dashboard. Um, we'll get back to this in a minute, but this is how you can open the trunk or the frunk from inside the car. You literally just go to the touch screen, you hit open. Aha. Uh -huh. So here's the frunk, the front trunk, if you will. And again, it's a very nice size. I like that it's lined. We did pay extra for the frunk liner and, um, that goes along with the trunk liner and then the mats in the front as well. We were told this is a great place to store your leftovers from dinner if you don't want it to stink up your car. Since I'm here and I did get a lot of questions about maintenance, really one of the few things I need to deal with occasionally, I guess, would be the windshield wiper fluid, which is pretty easy to access here, obviously. All right, let's hop back in and I'll give you a little tour. First of all, there are the pedals. Technically, one is a brake and one is an accelerator, not a gas pedal because there's no gas in this car. I'm going to refer to it as the gas pedal. And speaking of gas, while there is no gas in this car, there are two engines. It's a dual motor vehicle, which is means it's really, really fast. Okay, so here is the front, same leather seats. Here's my view. Let me pan you out a little bit. Inside the car, as you can see, there's no dash here. There's no odometer, speedometer, monitors of any kind. Uh, there's nothing there, which does take a little bit of getting used to. Also an adjustment for me, which is getting out of the car. These are normal controls for window, but to open the door, there's no, well, there is an emergency lever, but you just push this button and then push the door open. So let's look at a few of the other cool features before we get to the main attraction. This is where both the driver and the passenger can set their cell phones and it's wireless charging, which is really handy. However, if you want to charge it while you're using it, the passenger, of course, there are two USB chargers here. The glove box is pretty huge. To open it, you go over here and you go to glove box and voila. One more nice feature, really nice feature of the interior is the roof. The whole roof is glass. It's tinted, so you might not notice that it's glass, but it is. It doesn't open. It's not a sunroof. It's just the ultimate moonroof, and it's huge. I will add some footage of us driving. Later, I'll have my husband drive, and I'll film, but when you get in the car, this is essentially what you see. You can choose to change a few things, but this is the, the sort of default window. It shows you your car, what's open, Oh, I didn't show you the charging ports. We'll get to that. And then there's all kinds of fun buttons here. I'm not gonna get into all of it. Um, I'll just share some of the things that I really like and some of the things not so much. So one thing I don't really love is the temperature control. They're not really user-friendly when you're trying to drive your car. If you're a passenger in the car, it's great. You know, you don't have to worry about driving hands-free, but while it's easy for me to change the temperature, if I wanna change the speed or the direction of the air blowing, I have to first hit this as far as I know, and then it brings up that control panel. And the way to increase the fan speed, obviously pretty self-explanatory, you would hit that button. But as you're driving, it's you're taking your eyes off the road. So I don't love that. And to adjust the direction of the of the airflow, it's a you use your fingers. So you can move it up or down. You can use two fingers to spread it out or put it together and I can adjust them separately. Passenger and driver can have their own controls, but not their own um, temperatures. I don't think it could be entirely wrong. I haven't had the car long enough to learn everything. There are some cool temperature settings. So if you want to leave your dogs in the car and go run into a store, you hit dog and the climate and screen will stay on. Sentry mode is disabled and it locks it down so the, the dogs cannot get in the car. I mean, can get not get out of the car, I should say. One of the things it does when you're in dog mode is it turns this into a giant message board and I'll put in a clip of what it displays on here. So if someone peeks in and sees that your dogs are in here by themselves, if they look in, there's a message saying, hey, you know, owner will be right back. So one of the main reasons why I'm really having fun with this car, other than the driving experience is incredible, is the gadgets. So let's play with some of the options. Toy box is where I have the most fun. The first thing everybody asks about is something called emissions. And basically you can make your car fart. And <laughs> there are several different fart sounds to choose from. That's not a fart. That's short shorts ripper. I'm not gonna do all of them, but yeah, you get the idea. And the fun part is you can set this up before your passengers get in the car. So let's, 
and you can make the sound come from underneath that seat with the fart on demand. So if I push a button here on the uh, steering wheel, so that comes out. You can also make it come out of your car. Watch this. So we go over to Boombox, and you can have different sounds, either replace the horn sound, add on to the horn sound. I were to honk the horn, we could hear this. The reason that sounded so faint is you're hearing it from outside the car. It could be funny. It could be a little distracting. Um, you can also have sounds as you're driving. This one is pretty funny. So I can sound like an ice cream truck. You get the general idea. So you can have a lot of fun with the different sounds that it makes. We're gonna turn that off because I don't want that. Another fun thing, I guess if you're having to sit in the car for a while, is the romance option. You push that. Can you hear it? And as you sit here, it's turned the heat on. The, I think the car seat warmers are on as well. It's getting a little hot in here. Let's see if I can angle that a little bit better. It's getting warm in here. So for copyright reasons, I'm not gonna play this too long. So different <laughs> romantic music will come out of it. One time I tapped it and it was playing Barry White. It's a lot of fun. So um, some of the other things, this, you can be your own little DJ, sketch pad option. Um, there's just a few fun things. There's also the entertainment option. And under entertainment, you have a whole arcade. You can use the touch screen or you can actually get controllers to hook up to this and play a whole variety of video games. This is nuts. This is obviously not operational while you are driving, but it can be very entertaining, especially if you're sitting in the carpool line with a younger child and they want to entertain themselves. So that's all the arcade options. But then in theater, look at that. You can stream all of those and there are websites you can go to to actually add more apps to watch more things like ESPN or what have you. So one time we had to, we had to use a supercharger a few times before we had the home charger installed in our house and we caught up on a bunch of Netflix. And when you play it, you know what, let me just show you real quickly. Okay. So I just pulled up something really quickly that no one will be offended by the great British baking show. So as you can see, the picture's fabulous and it takes up the whole screen. So, and it uses the car stereo, so you get great sound. I mean, it's a full immersive experience. In some ways it's uh, it's better than what you might be having at your it. house. So you might be wondering where are all the controls? Well, down here, there's a bunch of options. So if you press that, it gives you all the basic controls, how to, what to set your exterior lights and all those things. So one of the most common questions that I want to address here is how do you figure out where, how to drive your car long distance? Where do you know when to stop? Well, for charging. Well, if you have this trip planner on here, when you type in to navigate where you want to drive to that's long distance, it will show you along the route where the superchargers are and where they think you should stop to get to the point where you don't run the thing all the way down to empty. So that's pretty nice. And then as far as navigation goes, let's see. Oxford, Mississippi. Let's just go to the University of Mississippi and see how it shows you where all the superchargers are. It gets you to all your stops and it tells you how you can plot out your trip. And it'll tell you how long you need to stay at each charger to get enough charge to get to the next point. Now, as you can see, it does add a little bit of time to your journey. I'm gonna have my husband drive so that I can film and I'll show you what it's like to be on the road with this thing. So this is the view when you're driving the car. We're sitting at a stoplight right now and it's showing that there's a car in front of us and in fact there is. And you'll, oh, and here comes one. See, it's showing other cars near us, which is kind of nice. It sort of looks like a video game. Up in the upper left of the screen is the speed see how fast we got to our cruising speed and then you can see what the actual speed limit is. I think you can see the lines in the road and you'll see a, a speed limit sign pop up as we pass one. If you watch the screen we're about to. There they are 
and you can see the yellow and red pop up around the car. That means that there's obstacles, in this case a curb, um, close to the side of the car. It's really like driving a video game. I would not recommend keeping your eyes on the screen. You should keep your eyes on the road, but here's what's happening in front of us. So you can get an idea of what it sees and what you see. One thing I wanted to show you, while the rear view mirror itself is actually a little smaller than I would like, you can get a much better look at your rear view if you hit the camera button. So what you're seeing is the, the camera out the rear of the car and this hits both your blind spots. If you really want to be safe when you're switching lanes and you're worried about your blind spots, you can pull the, pop that button as you're driving. It's that black one right there and you can see that or if you just want to see what's going on behind you and this won't turn off as you're driving which is a little bizarre and possibly distracting but i have to tell you a few times when i'm getting close to a stoplight and i feel like the guy behind me is just coming up on me a little too quickly i have quickly switched over to the camera just to see how close is this guy coming we're gonna show you how quickly it accelerates punch it Whoa! And there you go. We've reached cruising speed very quickly. This thing goes zero to 60 in just under three seconds. I believe it's 298. So it's fast. And I think, I hope the camera picked up that high pitched whining noise. That's the sound of extreme acceleration. So one of the cool things about the car is you can set it up to automatically open your garage door and fold your mirrors when you get with, see, ding. And the garage door is opening and my mirrors are folding and let's put her in the garage and we'll put her on the charger because we just got below 70% and we do like to wait until the battery level is, whoop, there it is, is below 70% before we start charging. Oh, and I love this part. For those of us that have issues knowing how far to pull the car in, <laughs> it tells you one more incredibly childish thing that I have to share with you. Actually, the guy who installed our home charger showed me this trick. We're going to charge her up. You can open the charge port by just hitting that um, lightning bolt, but we're going to tell the car to open it. And it's um, a little salty, but uh, no bad language. So PG. you push PG. it's PG. So you push and hold this button to um, voice command. So here we go. Open butthole. And the charge port is opened. All right. That was my last supercharge. It's been a while already. Let's go charge her up. So here's my garage. It's not clean, but it works. So we had a home charger installed. It's not a necessity, but I cannot imagine not having one. I'll get into that in the sit down portion. It kind of looks like I have a little gas station here in my garage. So this cable comes out at basically looks like a gas pump. This cable is 25 feet long, which is great because I have a three car garage and I am parked um, in the farther end. And we're just gonna pull this off. Here we go. We just put it in and you'll see the blue light change to green. And there we go. So it's changed to green. And as you can see, here is the app on my husband's phone. I'm actually filming on mine. And yes, I named my car test. Um, it's at 68%, it will take three hours to charge it to whatever, I think we set it at full. And my current range is 301 miles. I have the performance vehicle, not the um, long range. And there you go. One more thing about the charging, if you look at the big screen inside, it tells you how long is left and all the pertinent information, the voltage, how many uh, amps, kilowatts, all that stuff, if you are curious. I have tons of questions to get through. I'm not gonna answer them in any particular order, but I am going to answer the ones that were the most frequently asked. So the number one question was most definitely, why did you choose to get a Tesla? So I can tell you first and foremost, it was not out of any concern for the environment. My lease on my Jaguar was coming to a close in March, so we thought it was time to start looking for something new. I definitely wanted an SUV or crossover type vehicle large enough to hold my Weimaraner's crate. He needs to be crated when we drive. That's a whole other video. And so I needed cargo space. Honestly, what was out there was pretty limited. We are in the middle of a supply crisis for a lot of things, uh, most definitely for cars. 
and the options were just really limited and what there was was way over sticker and it was a long time to wait. So a big reason why I bought my Tesla is because I could, it was available. Um, we ordered it in September and two weeks later, it was in my garage. So that was a big reason. Another reason is I love gadgets and I'm always looking for more gadgets. I loved my Jaguar as far as the driving experience went, but it didn't have a lot of fun gadgets. And if you're looking for gadgets, a Tesla pretty much has every other car on the road beat as far as I know. So that was a main factor as well. A lot of questions, a lot of questions about the range, how far does it go? Do I have range anxiety? That kind of thing, can you drive it long distance? Well, for those of you who don't know me, when we do drive long distance and we road trip fairly often, we always rent a vehicle. We never use our personal vehicles for road trips for so many reasons, um, but mostly we don't like to put the extra miles on our car, whether we lease them or buy them, especially though if we lease them. We personally never plan to take our Tesla, the Model Y, anywhere long distance. The farthest I'd probably drive it is up to Austin. I'm in San Antonio currently. So about an hour, hour and a half is about as far as I plan on driving it. So that is not a concern for me, but as I showed you in the footage inside the vehicle, it goes, I don't have the long range, I chose the performance, but it goes about 301 miles on one charge, give or take, which is about the same size as your average gas powered vehicle. So if you think about it, do you get nervous when your car gets down to a quarter of a tank? I mean, maybe when I drive a gas powered vehicle, I tend to refill it right when I hit a half tank. I just always like to have at least a half a tank of gas in my car. Same goes for the Tesla. If I get below say 50%, at the very most, if I get below 70%, I'll plug it in and charge it overnight. So initially was there range anxiety? Yes. But once I started thinking about it instead of, oh, there's only this much left and started thinking of it the way I think of a gas car, it's the same idea, that went away. So you can drive it long distance, plenty of Tesla owners do, I just don't. And hand in hand with that is how long does it take to charge on a road trip? Well, it sort of depends on the time of day and how much is left on your battery. The lower you are on the battery charge, like if you're you know under say 20%, it's gonna charge much more quickly to get you up to a decent amount. Once you get to about 60, 70%, the charging slows. So while it took me about 30 minutes to go from 75 to 100%, it might not take that long to get me from near zero to say 50%. At home, I have a home charger. You saw that um, on the car tour. And that charges not as quickly as a supercharger, but way faster than if I just plugged it into a normal home outlet, which you can technically do. And the convenience of having the home charger is I'm not really worried about the range because if I wanted to, I could plug it in every single night. That will lower over time how much you can charge up your battery, just like a cell phone. You know, they tell you, don't plug your cell phone in every single time, let that battery drain a little bit. Same concept on the Tesla. Because I'm leasing the car and I'm gonna give it back in three years, I'm not as concerned about what I do to the battery, but um, having that home charger definitely adds a whole level of convenience. I can plug it in at night. If I know I'm gonna be home most of the day, like I work from home, if I don't have anything planned for that day, I can even plug it in then, just even for half an hour to top it off if I feel like it. So. That home charger is such a convenience. Do you need one? Technically not, but for instance, like I said, I live in San Antonio and there are really only two, kind of three superchargers in the whole San Antonio metro area and there's over a million people here. So it's kind of a pain, honestly. I live about 20 to 30 minutes away from the nearest supercharger. So you just gotta build that into your plan. I gotta allow for about an hour round trip to get there and depending on how long it takes and that takes another you know, 30 minutes to an hour out of my day. If you're going to buy a Tesla, they're not an inexpensive purchase. You might as well also buy the home charger. The home charger is $500. The other difference is when you use a supercharger, you have to pay for that. When you are charging at home, yes, you pay for it, but it doesn't really bump up your utility bill that much. We compared 
um, October's utility bill to last October's utility bill, and there was no noticeable difference in the average. Maybe $15, maybe. It's such a minute difference in the utility bill, you really aren't gonna see a difference. But speaking of the home charger, there were questions about the cost. So like I said, it's $500 just to buy it, and then it's gonna cost you some money to install it. And that all depends on your house. In my situation, I had the highest price possible because we have a detached garage, and I don't have 220 volt current running to the garage. So we had to change the main box on our house, and then we had to have them dig a trench and connect the new line to the detached garage. So that was about $3,000. If you're lucky enough to have an attached garage and you already have a dryer type outlet, like an outlet for a clothing dryer in your garage, it could be just a few hundred bucks. So it just depends on the circumstances. A lot of questions actually about cost. Another question was how much is car insurance? That all depends on where you live, of course, but I can tell you that the car insurance for the Tesla is less than what I paid for my Jaguar F-Pace. So that was a nice little break. And I think one more question about finances and cost was what's the ROI on your car and the ROI on the home charger? There is no return on investment in any car. The minute you roll that thing off the lot, the price, the value depreciates. So never look at a car as an investment opportunity. That's a terrible idea. Far better ways to do that. Um, as far as the ROI on the home charger, I'm never going to get that $3,000 back. I mean, I'm no matter how much I save versus charging at the supercharger, that was a, that was a big chunk. To be honest though, we leased the Jaguar. And when we called the dealership and asked if we could turn the car in early, not only did they say yes, but they gave us $5,000 on top of that for turning it in early because there's such limited inventory. So made a little money on that and then used some of that to cover the car uh, charging installation. Even so, the home charger, um, I don't look at it as a return on investment as far as finances, but as far as time, my time, and just the comfort of knowing I can charge my car whenever I feel like it is definitely worth I can't imagine owning a Tesla and not having access to a home charger. I know plenty of people do it, it's just not for me. I did get questions about maintenance. There really isn't any maintenance. There's very little maintenance on the car. Occasionally there will be software updates and that gets sent to the car over Wi-Fi overnight. So that's kind of neat. Like when I got the car, it didn't have car wash mode in the system yet. And as you can tell, there's lots of bells and whistles and sensors and cameras. And when you try to drive a Tesla, through a standard car wash, it just makes it go nuts. So Tesla recently sent out a software update that added a car wash mode so that you, when you get to the car wash, you push the button and it turns off the cameras and does a bunch of other things to make it very easy to go through a car wash. So they can add features to the car for free just through the internet. So that's kind of neat. Other maintenance that are standard on other vehicles like uh, oil changes, there's no oil to change. It's not a gas powered vehicle. Um, windshield wiper fluid, obviously you would need to add. Other kind of routine maintenance, windshield wiper blades, you're gonna have to replace eventually. Your tires will probably need to be replaced. The brake pads will eventually need to be replaced, but the brakes on a Tesla are different than other cars. They have regenerative, regenerative braking, so you actually wear down your brake pads uh, less, so you get a little more out of that. So very little as far as maintenance. If there is something, they need to do, um, more often than not, they're able to either do it over Wi-Fi or actually come to your house. So maintenance part, very tiny. A Lot of questions about how does it drive and was there a learning curve? It drives, it is so, so fun to drive. I was not anticipating at all how much fun it is to drive. I was the one that drove it home from the dealership, although technically in Texas, they're not called dealerships. Is it a showroom? There's some weird Texas law about not being able to sell non-gas power cars. I don't know how that works. So anyway, it's really not a dealership because no money is exchanged there. We did everything online. When I left the showroom, uh, it's on a frontage road of a highway on I-10. And when I got on <laughs> I-10 and I hit the gas like I normally would, I actually gave myself whiplash. I just got thrown back into my seat. I hit zero to 60 in just under three seconds and my body felt all of that. So 
that it's if you're into just I don't like speeding necessarily but just that initial thrill of getting off the line even at a stoplight that's a lot of fun but there's a huge learning curve on a Tesla whether it's the Model Y the X the 3 the S what have you a big learning curve it doesn't drive like a regular car most of it is one pedal driving the best analogy I can give you is it drives like a very expensive golf cart you push down on the gas pedal, it goes. You let up on the gas pedal, it stops. So I occasionally, very occasionally actually use the brake, but most of the time it's just finessing that accelerator a little bit more down, easing up a little bit, because if you just take your foot off the gas, it'll basically jerk, not to a complete stop. Like if you're going 70 on the highway, it's not gonna do that, but it jerks a lot. So the first couple of weeks for sure, there's a lot of jerking in the car. But my best way to explain what it's like to drive the car is I've always had, you know, I've gone from big SUVs, I had a minivan before that, a station wagon before that. I've always had the mom car. So I've never had the real fun driving experience. My husband has been on a continual midlife crisis for about a decade now. He's in a Lexus RCF. The car before that was a BMW M4. He had a Mercedes AMG C63. He had a Nissan GTR. And then the one that set off the midlife crisis was the Ma a Maserati Gran Turismo. So he's into driving. And since he's driven my Tesla, he doesn't enjoy driving his Lexus anymore. He's been considering trading his in for an electric one as well. Probably not the Tesla. He's thinking about the Porsche Taycan or one of the other ones, but we're not ready to get rid of the gas powered car. And I will get into some of the things I don't like about the Tesla. So while there's a lot of fun things about a Tesla, there are some things that I don't like about it, not enough to, to not buy the car, I would definitely buy it again. But I feel like one day the technology is going to be there, but we're not at the point where when you get to a quarter of a tank, so to speak, that you can just roll into a gas station, plug yourself in and fill up, so to speak, in what, 10 minutes, five minutes that it takes at a normal gas tank. It, it's a timely experience, to fill the thing up or to charge it all the way up. And I can't just tool around, like sometimes I like to drive around the hill country and just look at the site, so to speak, and we'll drive you know, a few hours and be like, oh, we're running low on gas, we'll just find a country gas station, fill up. Well, you can't do that in a Tesla. You kind of have to plan ahead and I don't like that. So I'm looking forward to the day when a Tesla can charge up to full capacity in five, 10, 15 minutes. We're not there yet. So I like knowing that we also have a gas powered car or when we had the freeze in February and we had no power for almost a week, the car isn't gonna drain all the way to empty, but what if my car had already been pretty close? It will drain and it drain, the battery does drain faster in colder weather. So that is a little concerning as well. So uh, if none of these things bother you, that's great. Um, I, for one, personally like that we're a two-car family and I still have a gas-powered car to rely on. Tesla has a ton of gadgets and that's great, except you don't know how to use a lot of them. It's not as intuitive as a traditional car. So there's a lot of things I've had to pull over in Google for things like I couldn't figure out where the hazard button is, or I didn't know how to put the car in drive. They didn't really do a great walkthrough when they handed over the car, I'll give you that. Um, no, I think they showed us how to put it in drive, they didn't show me how to put it in park. It's not like a normal car. Um, I didn't go through all that, this video is probably gonna be an hour as it is, so you can just watch, but it's not like a normal gear shift. Or I didn't know how to put my brights on, and I had to go home and Google it and change some settings on the control panel. It's stuff like that that can get a little bit annoying. I showed you how it's not so easy to uh, adjust the airflow on the air conditioning or heaters while you're driving. That's definitely a bit of a hazard if you have to look down and push a bunch of buttons and then look at a screen while you're supposed to be driving. I don't love that. Another thing, as many gadgets as there are on the car, uh, Tesla does not play well with Apple. So there's no Apple CarPlay, which is, I didn't have before, but I, I would have liked to have had. And they don't have Sirius on the Model Y. I have heard that you can get Sirius on the Model X, but I don't have a Model X, so it doesn't matter. So I can connect it through Bluetooth on my phone. But again, if you're driving and you wanna change the Sirius channel, 
um, or you know, go through your Apple CarPlay, your iTunes account. You've gotta take your eyes off the road to do that. I do love the super fast acceleration. The ride is incredibly smooth. Now, some people say it's a noisy ride. It's not a noisy ride, but the thing is you hear stuff outside the car because what you don't hear is an engine. There's no engine noise, so you're able to actually hear stuff that's outside the car more easily than you could when you had to compete with the sound of an engine. So that's kind of an interesting factor. It's a really fun car to ride. I feel like the ride is very smooth, but again, I'm coming from a Jaguar. Um, even though it was an SUV, it's still a sporty car, so it's a little more bumpy. I opted not to upgrade to the full self-driving capability. If I want to, at any time, I get on my Tesla app, I scroll up to upgrades and it has software upgrades and accessories. And if I just click software upgrades, I just hit that buy button. I have a credit card linked to my Tesla account and I can just add full self-driving capability for the low, low price of $10,000. Um, my husband is constantly reminding me, do not hit that button. But I think it's kind of neat that you can almost basically change your car. Like if I were in any other kind of traditional car and I wanted to add features to my car, I'd have to go buy a new model. But the Tesla allows you to upgrade and they're constantly coming up with free upgrades and all I do is send it over the internet and you essentially have a new car. This video is super long, so I'm gonna stop it here. If you have any specific questions, something I did not address, please do not hesitate to ask me down in the comments. You can always DM me on Instagram, at Ms. Gold Girl, if you'd prefer for the whole world not to see your comments. I actually end up seeing Instagram far more quickly than I see YouTube, so if you need something answered in a hurry, you can always message me over there. Thank you for watching today. Thanks for hanging out for a super long video. I hope you enjoyed it, learned something, and if you are a fellow Tesla driver, say hey. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.